Hi, good evening, everyone, or afternoon or morning, I guess, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my name is Sean Ramsey, and I'm honored to um, welcome you this evening. I'm the vice president here at ArtsBridge. And um, before I um, pass the, the baton to our panelists tonight, um, just a quick word about ArtsBridge. Our organization was founded in 2008. Um, with the mission of really giving uh, students the, the tools, information, and feedback um, on their artistic work and about the college admissions process, specifically in the arts. So we work with um, really students in all of the, the, the different artistic disciplines across the performing and visual arts, um, both on um, the college counseling side, as well as through a number of different artistic training programs that we offer. Um, on our, in our college consulting practice, we work with about 30 students a year um, in majors ranging from classical voice to fashion design to uh, theater performance. Um, and our artistic training programs that have been running since 2010, are um, also varying disciplines. So we have classical voice, summer program, uh, musical theater, dramatic acting. Um, we have a gap year uh, program. And most recently in 2022, we launched a, a one week uh, fashion design program during the summer. So we're, um, we're really excited to have you all with us tonight. Um, I'm going to just introduce my uh, colleague, ArtsBridge colleague, Jen Gilliman, who will then introduce our other panelists. Um, but just a quick word about Jen. I'll actually read uh, a bit of Jen's bio. With a background in arts leadership, counseling, and teaching, Jen has 20 years of experience in recruitment, admissions, portfolio development, and academic leadership in higher education. She's mentored thousands of student artists and spearheaded many arts initiatives at the Boston University College of Fine Arts, uh, serving as its inaugural Director of Arts Leadership and Innovation. Um, she was interim director of the, the BU School of Visual Arts and was a founding director of Boston University's Visual Arts Summer Institute, also known as VASI, uh, which is a pre-college arts program for high school students. So Jen, I will pass it on to you and uh, have a great webinar. Thank you, Sean, and welcome everybody. We're so happy to have you with us. I'd love to start by just having people put in the chat who you are, who's in the room with us, um, what, what year you are, if you're a student um, and what you're interested in, or if you're an art teacher or a parent, feel free to um, put something in the chat so we know who's in the room with us. Um, so, we're here today, we get to hear from uh, Siobhan, who's gonna be talking to us about um, all of her experience as an admissions leader. And um, before we do that, I just want to um, share a little bit about the um, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So um, we're excited to have Siobhan here representing it and she will tell more about it, but it's distinctive in its way that it provides students with an interdisciplinary curriculum and the necessary freedom to develop as artists, designers, and scholars. So they strive for a level of rigor, investigation, and cultural relevance. And this is something that makes um, SAIC kind of a special place. Students can translate complex ideas into tangible forms, such as painting, sculpture, film, performance, books, but more importantly, they can bring these areas together. And having worked with artists and student artists for all of these years, one thing that is so exciting is to see the way that students grow and learn and how you can take an arts education and build a very vibrant and exciting creative life in the arts. And so um, with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Siobhan Lombardi, who's going to give us a presentation about the school. And then we're also going to have an opportunity to hear from people um, take your questions that you can put in the chat and we'll be opening it up to Q&A at the end. So without further ado, Siobhan, take it away. Thanks so much, Jen and Sean and everyone. I'm so delighted to be here. 
the best part of my job is talking to young artists about their work and instilling in them the notion that your work does have value and that you have value. And I just, it's just such a great position to be in. My own career is very varied. And if you ever want to sit down and have a three hour conversation about the value of an arts education, I'm happy to do it. And you will leave knowing the value of what you what you do and what it means to the world around you. My personal soapbox is the creative economy. I've taught in the community college art system in Illinois. Um, I was a late in life master student and I've been a painter for many, many years. So I'm a little old school in that way. I like to call myself a Luddite that I still get the most pleasure out of painting. But um, your work has value. And the idea of an arts education is to bring out your best work. So before you judge yourself, don't. It's your arts education that's going to teach you and get you to where you want to be and how to investigate things. So should I start my presentation? That would be wonderful. Thank you. And let me just say um, I uh, thank you for letting us know that the chat is not enabled. And we'll get that fixed. And um, please add your comments once that is ready. Let me just start this and play from start. So I'll tell you a little bit about the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. It's one of the oldest independent art and design schools of the, uh, um, in the United States. And we are unique in a number of ways. We are affiliated with the Museum of the Art Institute of Chicago, making us the largest museum school campus in the country. And a lot of people think that the museum founded the school and it's exactly the other way around. We founded the museum. And originally, more than 150 years ago, the museum held only copies of great masterworks. So it held plaster scat, plaster casts of famous sculptures and copies of paintings and students would go and copy them to learn in the academy style. Today, it's the third largest collection in the world and it's part of our campus. So you have free reign over the museum and get to cut through it or spend a whole day there, see special exhibitions, special collections. And it's a really unique tool for artists. And I'm bringing that up because many of you have art organizations and museums in your own com communities. And they are a tremendous resource for you. And I know you like to follow a lot of different things on Instagram and social media. You should be following some of the museums too to see what's really, particularly contemporary art museums around the globe, to see what's really going on in contemporary art and, to, and design today. So what is a portfolio? A portfolio is a collection of works that describe your talents, skills, and interests in what you want to pursue in your artistic endeavor, no matter what that endeavor is. So it's going to look very different at different times. And you are going to create, if you choose a creative career, you are going to create multiple portfolios in your lifetime. If you're going into one of the design fields, you're going to have clients and clients are going to want to see different things. So you're going to over time customize your portfolio for what you want to tell us about yourself. For SAIC, if you're thinking of applying, we have no strict requirements on a portfolio, but it's important to thoroughly research the schools you are applying to, to understand what they want to see in a portfolio. Some of them get very, very specific. We do not. We want to see what excites you as a creator, what the intellectual ideas behind your work is, and it doesn't have to be a big important social cause, it may be the pleasure of paint and materials, you know, but we'd like to get a sense of that in your work. So you'll tell us about that, but really research that carefully because there are some schools that are specific as if you've taken a life drawing class, we wanna see three examples from that class. If you've taken a ceramics class, we wanna see three examples from that class. So really pay attention to that. And I'll just jump in and add to that. It's really important to kind of create a spreadsheet and do something with each, write down with each school because you're going to actually have different portfolios depending on the school that you're applying, applying to. So you wanna keep that straight. 
Absolutely. And spreadsheets can be your greatest friend. You may hate them right now, but with a little time, they will. you will be amazed what you use them for in your artistic career. Um, and then how do you get an idea of what your work is about? You know, you have this this whole volume of work you've been creating for a number of years, and you have some ideas of what you're interested in, but they don't seem to go together. So research contemporary artists, read what they write about their own work, see what strikes a chord with you, and then look, look at their work. And always look for the similarities, don't look for the differences. Every artist will see a difference from themselves and another artist, but look for the similarities. Find what they're going to talk, what they're talking about. I'm going to let you in on a big secret. There really is no new in art. Sometimes materials change, and the way materials are delivered or the messages delivered has changed. You know, 40 years ago, we weren't dealing with video like we're dealing with video today, but the messages are always the same. So feel free to really dig into other artists and see what they're saying about their work. A great resource is Art 21. It was a series produced by public television and every episode deals with a theme. So one might be comedy that it deals with. One might be motion. One might be the environment. And they'll th show three different artists and designers for every episode talking about their work, making their work, exhibiting their work and it really sort of takes the artists out of the pantheon putting them in your living room so you can understand that they're thinking about the same things you're thinking about and making the same things you're you're thinking about it's a great thing to have on on your computer while you're making work um, a lot of it is very funny and you just it's a, just a great resource another thing is to get feedback on your artwork you're going to get very used to this in college through critique. Be, remember that for someone to offer a criticism of your work is really a gift. So you might want, you might want to think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. I can tell you right now, the thing I miss most is critique. I miss having a friend who's an artist come into my studio and tell me what they see. It's a rich resource. So talk to your faculty, really listen to them. Talk to your peers. Talk to peers whose work is very different than your own and ask them what they think. You can glean some great ideas. And you can start getting great ways to talk about your work as you're explaining things to them. You know, it's really hard to talk about your own work. If you can talk and write about your own work, um, I don't know if you're anything like me, I'm a real introvert. If you can talk and write about your own work, you can talk and write about anything. It's really hard for artists to do. So if you can get that, you know, get comfortable with that, you'll be able to talk about anything. Um, follow your interests. Don't feel you have to make something if you're not interested in it. If you're not interested in, I think we all are, but if you're not particularly interested in environmentalism in your work, don't put it in your work. Don't put a fake cause in there because you think it has to be there. Be authentic with your work if it interests you. You know, if your family interests you, do work about your family. If your community interests you, do work about your community. If social justice interests you, do work about social justice. But don't think you have to have a cause in your work that's important because your work is already important. Write about your work. Jump in and ask a question about that. Yeah. In um, for, for your admissions committee, if a student has a love for a particular area and they kind of want to focus on that, yep. do you recommend that they just dive in and have the whole portfolio kind of focused in that one area? Or do you like to see some, some breadth and depth? So it depends on how much work you have in that area. Mm -hmm. So I always like to see some, I like to see how you got to that place. Mm -hmm. That's what I like to see. I like to see the road traveled to get to that place. So not all your work has to be about that. But if you have a trajectory in your work that got you to that place, let's see that. Does that make sense? 
It does. And then would you recommend, because some, you know, people, as the more work the students do, the more opportunity they have to improve. So do you recommend that maybe in the, like on, in slide room, making note that I did this in my junior year and that brought me here. So even though it might not be your strongest piece, when you can see the roadmap of how they got from here to there, that has value, right? Absolutely. So when you're presenting your portfolio, what's going to happen? I'm going to guess that most of you are going to be applying to your colleges through the common application, which allows you to complete one application and send it to multiple schools. Then you will be provided with a link to upload to slide room for the schools you're applying to. And that's where you upload your portfolio. For each slide, there is a space, and we're going to talk about documentation a little later. For each slide, there is an opportunity to give us the title of your work, the dimensions of your work, very important, don't leave that off, the dimensions of your work, the material it's made with, and then some brief thoughts about it. You will also have the opportunity, and it's a requirement for SAIC, to provide an artist statement. Now, your artist statement is not your biography. All of us at the school, and I'm sure Jen has the same experience, at some point in her life, picked up an art making material and her life was forever changed. And I'm sure with a lot of you too. So we all share that in common. So don't tell us about, I was four years old and picked up a crayon and, and that's what started me. What you're doing in your artist statement is you are contextualizing your portfolio. You're telling us how you got to where you are, what we're seeing, why you make it, what you make it with, and where you want to go. And I'm going to jump back to writing about your work. So this goes back to when I was talking about if you can write and speak about your work, you can write and speak about anything. A lot of times we don't understand our work until we write about it. And I like to start with a very basic assessment of my work when I'm writing it. So I will start with, this is a two-dimensional piece that is 18 by 24 inches large, made of oil on canvas that depicts people doing this. So do, just telling us exactly what we're seeing. Then go into the whys when you're looking at your work. When you can describe your work, you're going to start noticing themes that happen over and over again and why you are painting and drawing and sculpting them and while you're designing. And those commonalities help form the basis of what your work is about. I write about my work in my sketchbook often now more than I sketch in my sketchbook or write about art in my sketchbook more because that's where I start looking for the common threads. The other thing I'm going to say is take some risks for your work. Skill is incredibly important because I like to quote a famous choreographer, Carol Armitage, an interview. She does very, she choreographs very abstract modern dance, contemporary dance pieces. And if you looked at them and did not know the rigor of dance, you would say, well, this isn't about anything, but it very clearly is. And you will very definitely have an emotional reaction or an understanding of her dances once you've seen them. But an interviewer asked her one time, is craft, meaning skill, important to your work? And she said, craft makes a work legible. So when you have the skills down, you're no longer fighting with your materials to express what you want to say. And that's why, why craft is really important, knowing how to use the materials you're using. But do be willing to take risks with them. You may have horrible failures when you're taking risks, but you learn a thousand times more from a failure than you do from one success, from a hundred successes. So take risks, deal with proportion, deal with manipulating things, use a medium that you're not used to. And my favorite piece of advice is, and I know you have one of the, at least one of these, pay attention to that piece of work that you did that you say you hate, that you've shoved into the back of your closet or under your bed, but you are unwilling to throw away because I'm guessing there's a there there 
and there's something in that piece of work that's not letting you throw it away. So take it out and assess it. See if there, see what areas you like about it. Push things in your work. Don't just stay in your comfort zone. There's a question in the chat about uh, whether it's possible to do, say, stage performance and drawing and do kind of double major, bring these areas together. So we're a little unique this way. We're an entirely interdisciplinary school. Mm -hmm. We sort of coined the term of, of interdisciplinary education. So there are no majors at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Most, all of the students that are participating in any of the fields of art and design are pursuing a BFA in studio. And what this allows you to do is move seamlessly through our academic departments to create the kind of work you want to create so that you're doing what you want to do when you graduate from school. So you could seamlessly move through the performance and printmaking or drawing department and many, many students do. do. I am traveling this week with one of our admissions counselors, Martel, and he started out in painting and drawing. And he took a performance class and fell in love with it at SAIC. And his practice is now around sound performance and rap. So, and he's performing professionally in Chicago. So you never know where it's gonna lead you. And we want you to have that ability to move through freely through the academic departments. Another example is many of our fashion students take performance because they wanna understand how a garment works on a body and what it feels like and how it moves before they craft the garment. Um, in visual communications design, we have students that take classes, a lot of classes in um, printmaking and photography to understand pre and post production, or they're taking art and technology classes to understand designing for apps and the internet. So you work very closely with your academic advisors and you fa your faculty, and you sort of customize your degree at SAIC. Thank you. Now, as we spoke about before, tailor your portfolio to each school for each application. So start that spreadsheet, understand what you're gonna be submitting for each school. Pay attention to the order of your portfolio. It does not have to be in, in the word is just a chronological order. So you don't have to start with the oldest piece first. My, the way I like to do it is to lay everything out on the floor and start grouping things together. You know, it's that old song from, I think it was from Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. So look what goes together. Then start writing and talking about why they go together and why you're seeing a progression of these work. The other works. The other thing I always suggest is start with your strongest, one of your strongest pieces, and end with your strongest, one of your strongest pieces. You've got to understand that starting around well, deadline date, November 15th, and most of the schools and of the ACAD schools, which is the Association of Independent Art and Design Schools, are all going to start really reviewing portfolios right after Thanksgiving. So slide room gets very slow at that time. It's very funny. But we're looking at thousands upon thousands of portfolios. Everyone Every portfolio that is submitted to SAIC is reviewed by at least three counselors. So if you're starting out strong, you're going to capture our interest. And if you're ending strong, we're going to remember that portfolio that we saw. And we'll probably go back through it again and again. So I know it sounds very machine-like that we're reviewing so many of these, it's a very exciting time for us. We're always like, now that we're back in person, we're going to be bouncing between each other's offices and say, hey, come, come and look at this one, or we'll be chatting about this one. Take a look at number three in this one. And it's a very exciting time. We love seeing your work. But starting with a strong one and finishing with a strong one is really, really important. Let's talk about your artist statement too that I said before. As I mentioned, it's not your biography. 
if there is something really important in your life that you want to talk about, we have an optional essay in the application that you can tell us if there's a particular challenge you've faced, if there's something you feel that we should know, you can include that in the essay. But your artist statement is all about your work. So who are you as an artist? Why are you making work? What inspires you? Use your own voice. You read a lot of arts journalism that is so-called art speak. Save that later for a critique. Don't try to embellish your words. Be very truthful and very plain in your language. We love hearing your own voice. There is a famous sculptor, Donald Judd. He did minimalist sculpture, but before he was successful with his sculpture, he worked as an arts journalist. And if you can ever find any of his arts criticism or art reviews online, you should read them. They are as, as minimal and plain as his work is. And it's just so refreshing. So just hearing your own voice about you as an artist and what your work is about and what it's made with is really a great way to approach your artist statement. Also, proofread. Don't count on spell check. Have your school counselor read it for you. You know, take a look at your artist statement. I'm kind of a grammar police person. <laughs> And, and it's because I was so bad when I was young. So really have someone proof your work for you. So for SAIC, we talked about that we have no distinct restrictions except the number of pieces you're submitting. So can you submit sketchbook work? And you absolutely can. And I'm going to show you um, some examples of how a sketchbook was depicted when it was submitted in a portfolio. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, I kind of went for the wow factor in this presentation. So, because I wanted it to remain visually interesting for you. So please know that this is really some very advanced work we saw in student portfolios that had access to great facilities and arts education. Some of you may not have had that at your school. So we understand that, we get that. We read your application very closely. If we're not seeing any art schools on your transcript, we're saying this student is self-taught. If we're seeing that you didn't have any art classes at your high school, but then you participated at an arts organization, we're gonna say, wow, the student has a real love of what they're doing and they're not getting it school at school, so they're getting it elsewhere. And that's all very positive. But just know, please don't judge yourself on these portfolios. We wanted to keep you visually interested. And I can tell you this particular image was not for a portfolio. It was work that was done by a student while at SAIC mm -hmm. and shot at one of our, our local um, arboretums. But here's a great way a student showed their portfolio. So it's three pages from it. And this is one where they're not showing us too much about what they're going to make. They have some, you know, diagrammatics here showing us, but they're showing us their thinking process. And that's really, really important. Um, like thinking about the shadows of objects, thinking about, you know, Richard Tuttle is a contemporary artist that did a whole series on dealing with the shadows of drawings from wire or shadows of wires that he turned into wall drawings, um, thinking about sounds of objects. So this shows us what the student is thinking about, what interests them. And sometimes it's just how you play in your sketchbook. You know, many times your sketchbook, no one ever sees. So you, you get to play and just go freely at it. What is most fascinating to me in this particular sketchbook is that big black blob that has something mixed into it. Mm -hmm. So maybe they were smearing something out, but it turned into something interesting. And I like to think in your sketchbook, you're just freely thinking and and just playing and that's what so much of art is you should always have a sense of play to your work here's another one these are just broad brush strokes that were done in the sketchbook we've also had students send us animated sketchbooks so it's really a little film of them flipping through their sketchbook so if you have a really jam-packed sketchbook that's great don't show us more than five minutes of moving imagery though 
that gets a little long. If Here's I could someone... jump in with a quick yeah. question that was in the chat. Somebody was um, interested in studying animation and wondered if it was required to include other work. I know you said that it's that there are no requirements. So if somebody chose to focus on just sharing animated pieces, that would be okay or how? Absolutely. Okay. We do limit time-based work to five minutes, however. Totally. So know that- For each gonna... individual piece or total? In total. It get, total. Yep. Total of five minutes of time-based work. So you might have to show us snippets or edits from some time-based work. And I'm going to answer that to the sort of the inverse also. Many students have not had access to anim animation equipment mm -hmm. yet. So they want to go into animation, but they haven't done it yet. That's fine with us too. But what I do challenge you to do is question what animation is. So animation is a series of still images that when they're put together, create an effect of motion. So there are things that are animation that are you aren't even thinking about, like a flip book is an animation. So always question what the meaning of something is, and you can find a way to demonstrate how you want to pursue that. Thank you. This sketchbook is crazy and interesting and fun, and it has become an object in itself. Mm -hmm. So you could see how this sketchbook could demonstrate how someone is thinking about going into sculpture or may end up in that. And I don't know if they did, but these this sketchbook certainly seems like a sculptural object to me. So that's something you want to pay attention to within your sketchbook too. There are a variety of ways of thinking of your portfolio. So working in a series, media focused, experimental, breath, concept driven, and observational. And I would almost say an observational and breath portfolio could be the same. So a series of work would be dealing with a, a group of works that are all addressing the same concept or idea. And this is a person that sort of, sort of, not sort of, but was interested in the human figure and what happens when it's mixed and depicted with other media. And how do you break apart and fragment and show the portrait of a person that is not a straight representation of that person in portraiture? So this work is very much still a portrait They've broken it down into non-traditional materials. It's collaged. And the, some of the things that are collaged into it are interesting, such as using a, a pattern, a fabric, a clothes making pattern to show the body. So that directly ties back to it being on the body. Really breaking this down, segmenting the figure more and more as it becomes an experiment and playing with paint and materials. And except for a few areas like the nose, this individual isn't really drawing and painting the body parts. They're relying on collaged imagery to depict those portions. And here it is again going into three-dimensional where there is more imagery determined, but now you're noticing maybe less of that because you're noticing the sculptural form or you're thinking about how that body is framed within the work. So it remains visually interesting and it is portraiture. And I, we see a lot of portraiture in, in portfolios. And one of the reasons is, and this is my own theory, but if you think about when you're an infant, what is the first thing you're gonna imprint upon? It's probably your mother's face. So that remains a lifelong interest. So portraiture is still very viable, but always question in your mind, how might you do it differently? Mm. And pretty much this whole, whole portfolio was a series that was dealing with portraiture. 
So media focused is where you're dealing with one or two media that you like to work in. And this one is photography. And I kind of like to call this the, the Fargo portfolio, just because of the scene, it makes me think of the movie Fargo when William H. Macy is in that parking lot. And if you haven't seen it when you're 18, go see it. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of mix of architecture, environment, and then man-made objects in this portfolio. And there's a real sense of isolation in this portfolio. So I can pretty clearly tell, even from the get-go, that these photographs are done by the same person. You never get to know who these individuals are. In that first image, you're dealing with the vestige of people being there. The people aren't even seen, but you can tell they were there by the tire tracks. Here, you're not, you don't get to identify them. They're sort of anonymous. Again, an anonymous per person walking within this isolated structure and those sort of bare winter trees illuminate that sense of isolation. Even the, the people are in there and they're doing a fun activity, but they're so separate from each other. And there's no way they can ever intermingle because of where they are. It would be pretty precarious if they tried to reach out and shake each other's hands. Here, this is a vehicle for humans to use, yet no one's using it. So it's sort of the imprint of structures and places used by people, yet very sort of lonely and isolated. And this is just visually a really interesting composition, that yellow school bus on the black and white structure. So I'm not sure this one necessarily goes with the other ones, but it's a pretty stunning image. So I can certainly see why the artist included it. Then there's a variety of work. So this is just purely experimental. And this student was just experimenting with so many things. This looks like oil pastel and marker and chalk. And again, traditional subject matter of portraits or a grouping of people, but it takes you a moment, except for the eyes, it really takes you a moment to notice. And here experimenting with smaller made objects and clay. And this is sort of a um, brutalist approach to it. So not finessing the materials at all. Yet there's that weird juxtaposition of the metallic paint and glaze on them, which lends a sense of preciousness to them, even though they're very rough hewn and not finely made. And that idea of the hand is falling back into it again. So now they're actually depicting the hands working with material. So I now I see that this artist is starting to go somewhere with this. They've made some things by hand. Now they're showing their hands after making things by hand. And a series of prints that demonstrate true evidence of the hand. So they do not look machine made and a multiple of them. And then this, and you'll do these when you're in school, if you take photography classes, showing the movement of something with light through a space. So it's sort of a time-lapse series of photography and it depends on your exposure on your camera and something holding light. So there is a the handmade quality to this or evidence of movement in them. And then the breath portfolio is a variety of work. So you've been, and this happens a lot with school portfolios, you've been using, going from one subject to another, learning a variety of media, and you want to show us sort of your best and brightest of work you've done in different media. So it might be pen and ink drawings. It might be a more illustrative approach with pen and ink drawings. This person also made jewelry that they're very fond of. So they're going to show us that they made jewelry. And they made sculpture. And I'm seeing that they made sculpture maybe after. And I'm going to go back and look at when they created these because they were making jewelry and they got interested in making sculpture, which then turned into wearables. But taking that idea of the drawn and painted and now putting it on 
a, a garment and maybe even constructing this garment. And they sew as well that with the colorful appliques on them. So there is no continuity in meaning between these pieces whatsoever, but they're working in a variety of media and they wanna show us that they're fearless in trying different media. And then there's concept driven. So this is when you are addressing a particular topic in your work. And this is a young artist dealing with their Asian American heritage. in their work through a variety of illustrations. And that Mickey Mouse is actually 3D. So if you had a pair of 3D glasses on, he'd be, he'd be three-dimensional. But also taking it into murals they've done. And then observation and com content can do a lot with breath too. So if you're doing observational drawings, and taking those and playing with those and sort of mixing them up. This shows a sense of experimentation as well. We're still dealing with these portraits. They're breaking down more and more as we look at them. They turned into it, turned this into an animation. And then sort of taking all of those pieces of those backgrounds and the way they were manipulating the settings or even the skin of that first drawing as an illustration for sound in an animation. So there is a trajectory between the initial pieces as they're breaking things down to that very last piece. I was just going to say, I want to thank you for showing the range. And I just want to underscore that these are all different approaches. And because you can put together any kind of portfolio you wish, there are no requirements, you can really approach this in a highly personalized way. Mm -hmm. And what I hear you talking about is, you know, authenticity, you value curiosity and seeing where someone's curiosity leads them, um, experimentation and um, intention and thoughtfulness. So thinking of the through lines between those pieces. Absolutely. Thank you. And you might not know what your work is about yet. It's about something, I guarantee that for you. It is about something, you might not know what that is. So that's why it's really valuable to get feedback mm -hmm. and to write about your work, to discover what it is you're making and why you make it. I. So I graduate, I got my BFA many, many years ago, and I was never going to go on to get my MFA. And I went many years later and finally got my F MFA. And I discovered when I was completing my MFA that my work, and I'm talking about a 30 year span, my work in my MFA was about exactly the same thing that my work was as a BFA student but I didn't know what my work was about as a BFA student. And it took me that long to figure it out that although it looked very different, I was always talking about the same thing. So you are talking about something, who knows what that is, but let's find out, let's learn. It's really exciting to do. And a way to do that is feedback and go to portfolio reviews, talk to the schools you're interested in. Oops. So I'm going to talk I'm about do a, a time check because we're at 646 uh, and we definitely want to leave time for questions. Sure. And we I'm going to buzz the portfolio to, or the presentation as well. So I'm going to go through this really quickly. Some do's and don'ts. So I know you're all so many of you are interested in anime and manga, and it's been a very strong influence. But if you are copying this style of drawing exclusively in your portfolio, you are mediating somebody else's work. You are copying it. You're not showing us your skills. You're showing us that you can do something that someone else does. And I would love to see what your animated characters look like. And I would love to see what the story you've created is that you're going to be having your characters tell. Celebrities. So unless Billie Eilish and Timothee Chalmay are sitting in your kitchen and you're drawing them, this mm -hmm. is another example 
where you are mediating another artist's work, the photographer that took these pictures. So you can work from photographs, but take the photographs yourself. Mm -hmm. Your experience of that subject matter, how they sound, how they smell, how they move, how they look, is going to bring authenticity to your own work. So no looking for those free images on the internet and using those. Show the individual piece. Don't put anything else on the slide. We just want to see the work. Don't give us a, your social media account for a portfolio and don't give us a website for your portfolio because you're going to separate us just an additional step from your portfolio and we're going to get irritated. Backgrounds can be really distracting. Sometimes we can't tell if we're looking at a work or an installation. So make sure we're not distracted from the work we're supposed to see, crop to the edges. You do not have to buy an expensive camera. Your smartphone has strong enough resolution. Here's some nice jewelry just on a plain white background. Keep it neutral so we can see the color of your work. Mm -hmm. Don't put too many images on a slide thinking you're going to get crammed more work into your portfolio. Remember, we're reviewing this on a computer and we'd like to see the work for what the work is. So 10 to 15 slides only and don't cram too much work into it. Here's a, an efficient way of showing us that it had multiple pages in a really clean and distinct way. And a fashion creation, just showing us the back and front. There are simple ways to set up light boxes for your exhibits. Don't give us text in your slides. Save that for the description on the side of the page. We don't want to hear about your process in the slide. We just want to look at your good work. Another example. This is all that text about the dimensions and the materials. That goes in the description panel. Just let us see and enjoy your work. So just to recap, build upon the existing ideas and materials that drive your work, experiment and take risks, research artists and subject matter beyond an initial Google search or social media, go to museums, art centers, and galleries. Seeing that work live and in person is, is amazing. Order is important, start strong, end strong, and tailor your portfolios to each school's individual requirements. So just basically application requirements, common app, portfolio, artist statement, high school transcripts, letter of recommendation, and we test scores are optional this year. If you're an international applicant, we may have a requirement. So don't ask us to pre-waive. Let us look at your application first. And, I, and these I just are our deadlines. Jump in and say too, um, Sometimes students wonder, you know, it says 10 to 15. Does that mean I should really give 15, but I really only have 10 strong pieces? What are your thoughts on that? Less is more. If you've got 10 strong pieces, don't feel you have to put those other five in to make us see more of your work. 10 is perfectly acceptable because we're also looking at how you're thinking about editing your work. Mm -hmm. How are you, you curating your portfolio is really important to us. So just don't throw something in. Now, if you do have that one-off piece that doesn't seem to go with any of the others, but you love it, put it in and tell us why you're including that. Say, this doesn't really go with the other body of work, but I was proud of what I accomplished in this work because. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. That's really helpful. It's helpful to see the work. It's helpful to hear you talk about um, the portfolio. So that's great. Uh, my first question is about this merit scholarship deadline on January 15th. Can you talk about um, what needs to happen to be, is everybody automatically considered? And what do you, um, what percentage of students get merit scholarships? What's the average uh, merit award? And what would you advise the students on this call to, to be part of that pool of applicants? So the first thing you want to look at is that November 15th deadline, and I'll go into what we consider for merit scholarships. Um, the November 15th deadline is non-binding, mm -hmm. but it affords you the opportunity to possibly have a decision by the first of the year. You still have all the way until May 1st decision date to make your decision, but it is showing us 
that you would really like to be considered to attend. And it's when the most money is available as well. January 15th is really the merit scholarship deadline. So you can still get a really great scholarship by January 15th if you're accepted. After that, the till is sort of going to dry up. We're going to be reviewing applications on a case-by-case -case basis. And after April 15th, which is the final deadline, really there, there is not a lot of scholarship opportunity left. So the best scholarships are going to be available that no, before Christmas, really by the November 15th, and then definitely by January 15th. Now, our merit scholarships are based on the strength of your application. So as you could hear me describe, we are really closely reading and looking at everything in your application. We're looking at things like, did you have a job after school? What other art activities did you participate in? Are you doing any other community activities? We're looking at your grade point average because our academics are very rigorous. We're looking at your artist statement. We are looking mostly at that portfolio and our merit scholarships go towards tuition only. Every admitted student is automatically considered for a merit scholarship. More than 90% of our students receive them and they can be as high as 60% of tuition and 65% of tuition. And the merit, the portfolio, is 60% of the merit scholarship. Mm -hmm. So when we're reviewing everything, when we're reviewing your application, your artist statement, your portfolio, your activities, your GPA, that most important thing is the portfolio. So you wanna take care with it. Right, and can you give a range of what the merit scholarships might be from what to what? Do you, is there? Yeah, a they can they can be up to more than around twenty five thousand dollars a year. They can be now. Our merit scholarships are separate from need based as well, so these are just on the strength of your portfolio. Once we've received your FAFSA information. Student Financial Services, you've identified that there's additional needs. Student Financial Services looks at what's available to you, and then they'll go to our vice president and say there's additional need here. And you might get need-based scholarships as well, or work study, or other grants and aid. But the merit scholarship is really on how we're viewing the strength of your application. Right. Thank you. Sure. Um, some students have spent a lot of time making art. It's something that they absolutely, it's where their focus, that's where their energy goes. And academically, that's not where they were shining as, as a high school student. Um, how do you look at, if you're looking at the, if the portfolio is 60% valued, is there a place for, I mean, do you, is that something that you might factor in that that's where someone's really finding success and that's their emphasis? Absolutely. And so there are a number of ways too that we're looking at the academics. We have an average GPA. You know, we don't have a, a real required GPA. It's hard to get in if you're below a 2.8. I'm going to be really honest with you. Our average admitted GPA is a 3.6, but that's just the average. Very often, and if you're a student like I was, I excelled in the humanities, in literature, in history. I did great with those. I did great with the physical sciences like anatomy. And I even did pretty well with geometry because I could get the spatialism of it. Put an algebra problem in front of me or a physics problem or a chemistry problem, I tanked. So we, as I said, we read your application very closely. And if we see you're excelling in your English literature, and let's say your GPA is like borderline, and we're seeing that you really sort of tanked out in physics, but we see you're exceeding in your, in your classes that involve reading and comprehension, that's a bonus. So not everyone has a math brain. Great. And I want to just, um, we only have time for a couple more questions. I want to invite anybody who has something they'd like to add to put it in the chat right now so we can get to it. Um, I just wanted to also ask about the inverse. If you have a student who has pretty strong academics, but they haven't really had a chance to focus 
a lot on the portfolio. It's something that they are interested in. What advice do you have for somebody who might be in the early stages of developing a portfolio? I would say engage with us. So we mm -hmm. have a variety of events. You can meet with the, you know, you can go to any national portfolio day. We have a lot of SAIC days around our country, around the country, if you, and internationally. So that link there, that's saic.edu, UG events. You can meet with a counselor individually and do a virtual portfolio review. You can do this as many times as you want to during the application period. We've had students that come back and say, okay, I'm getting ready to hit the submit button. Can you take one final look at my portfolio? We're happy to do that. That's our job. Everyone thinks that admissions counselors are the hand that blocks the door. We would be horrible failures if that was the case. Mm -hmm. Our job is to help you put the best application together to get into the school and get the best scholarship. So please don't be afraid to reach out to admissions counselors. Don't be afraid to get a portfolio review. Take advantage of us. That's our job. That's amazing. It's amazingly generous. So students could contact um, you and set up a one-on-one -on -one portfolio review. Is that possible? You have one-on-one -on -one portfolio reviews that are- We do. If you go to our event, and it's different people from the department yep. available at different times. As I said, everyone at SAIC is an artist or designer. <laughs> so we have, we have a link on our website for virtual portfolio reviews, and you schedule an appointment. And you meet with someone and you can meet with different people, depending on who it's going to be. Most of them are admissions counselors or faculty and um, or alums that are starting out in their their professional career. And they'll talk to you about your portfolio and and how maybe give you suggestions on how you might want to be thinking about it. And you don't only have to do this when you're a senior. You can do it when you're a freshman. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I want to just say a Big thank you to Siobhan for sharing all this wisdom with us. I also really want to acknowledge the students on this call and the parents who are representing students. Finding a path in uh, going to art school takes courage and bravery and risk-taking. And I just am so um, excited that you're joining us to gather this information so you can go into this process feeling informed and excited. And if we can be a resource at ArtsBridge, let us know. And as you heard from Javon, if she can be a resource at SAIC, let her, her know or contact their office and one of her colleagues can meet with you. Thank you for making time to join us tonight. And, um, and please stay in touch with us. And that's the conclusion of our event tonight. Thank you. Thank you all. And Jen, thanks to organizations like ArtsBridge that just do amazing work with students. So we're so grateful for you. Oh, thank you. What a joy for us. And good luck, students. Yes. <laughs>